Hello and welcome to Canada's History's Fall Webinar Series. This series revolves around women's history. Presenters will speak about prominent figures, moments, and places in Canada's women's history, as well as what has influenced the teaching of women's history in the classroom and what it looks like today. Tonight, Renee Bondi will lead a discussion about the life and politics of Agnes McPhail. This is the fifth of seven webinars in the series, so keep on coming back. A little bit about Canada's history. Canada's history is proud to bring you this webinar series as well as our many other award opportunities and publications. Canada's history is dedicated to promoting greater popular interest in Canadian history, principally through publishing, education, and recognition programs. Our flagship publications are Canada's History Magazine and Kayak Canada's History Magazine for Kids. Each year, Canada's history recognizes excellence and honors the achievements of history makers and enthusiasts of all ages, predominantly through the Governor General's History Awards. If you would like to know more about these opportunities and these publications, I encourage you to click on the hyperlinks on the screen now and save them for later. And in all cases, you're always welcome to email me if you have a question about us. Canada's history's vision is a Canada where people are deeply engaged in connecting with their shared past. In preparation tonight, just a few tips so everything goes smoothly. First of all, I'm going to ensure that everybody can hear me, right? I'm just looking for one or two affirmatives in the chat box, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. You're, you are all welcome to use this chat box to ask questions throughout the webinar and Renee will respond as she sees fit. Great, thanks Norma and Eve Evelyn. So to have the best possible experience tonight, uh, close down any large programs. Those of you who have come out before know this, Photoshop, uh, other Adobe products, they, they slow down your computer uh, and they might cause a lag and we don't want any of that. Uh, but if it does happen, or you, if you do get kicked out of the room at any point, know that we are recording tonight's webinar, and it will be available in the coming days afterwards, and you will, of course, get an email when it is ready to watch on our YouTube channel, which you can link to now and check out our other webinars later on. We're also on social media, so if you are too, we highly recommend that you tweet at us, follow us on Twitter, uh, like us on Facebook, uh, tell us how you like tonight's webinar, comment on tonight's webinar there, maybe generate a conversation on uh, those platforms, that would be great. So a little bit about Renee before we jump in. Renee Bondi teaches in the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Windsor, where she offers courses on the history of women's movements in North America, women and religion, and marriage and gender. A Canadian historian, Renee's research includes histories of women, of religious, oh, excuse me. Renee's research includes histories of women religions, including the Ursuline Sisters of the Chatham Union. Renee is the author of Pilgrims in Service, the Chatham Ursuline, Ursulines, Volume 3, commissioned by the Ur Ursuline Sisters in commemoration of the 150th anniversary of their founding. She is the co-editor of the recent collection, Feminist Pedagogy in Higher Education, and a regular contributing contributor to Horizons Magazine. Excuse me. So with that, I will upload Renee's presentation, and I'm happy to welcome Renee into the conversation. Okay, well, thank you, Jessica. Um, could I get somebody in the chat to let me know that you can hear me? Great. Um, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, thanks for coming out to the webinar this evening, and thanks to Jessica and the good people at Canada's History for inviting me to present this in this year's series, which, as Jessica noted, features topics in women's history. I'm a Canadian historian by training, and I'm especially passionate about women's history. So I commend Canada's History for their dedication to topics in women's history in this year's series. I am coming to you this evening from Windsor, Ontario, where I teach, as Jessica mentioned, in the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Windsor. You're looking at an aerial view of the University of Windsor. Our campus is located near the southwest tip of the province of Ontario, and the campus is nestled under the Ambassador Bridge, which you see there in the photograph, which spans the Detroit River, the border between Canada and the United States. Now, when I was asked to create a webinar for this series, Agnes McPhail was a suggested topic. And earlier this year, I wrote a short article on McPhail for a special history edition of Horizons magazine. 50 women who changed Canada. And really, any number of the 50 women featured in this issue would be fine subjects for a webinar. But I'd done a bit of research on McPhail, and I was really keen to learn more about her. Um, in order to start to look at a few more primary sources, uh, I visited the Grey Roots Museum and Archives in Owen Sound, Ontario, um, which is a wonderful uh, source for information on McPhail. And another very impressive source is an online collection, the Agnes McPhail Digital Collection, which is an archive established by the Grey Highlands Public Library. And I'll include uh, these these references and others in the selected bibliography at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So in addition to quite a number of good primary sources on McPhail, there have also been uh, a few excellent uh, monographs written on McPhail in the past few decades. Um, and I'm showing you just a, a few of these. Um, these are by Doris Pennington, uh, Terry Crowley, and Rachel Wyatt. And again, I'll include those uh, in a bibliography for you at the end of the presentation. It seems to me especially timely to discuss McPhail this fall with the announcement of the Liberal government's cabinet, unprecedented in its gender parity. When asked why it was so important to him to have gender balance in his cabinet, Trudeau replied, because it's 2015. And I can't help but think that McPhail, who at the time of her election was the first and only female member of parliament elected, may have espoused a similar rationale as she sought to establish herself among a house of male parliamentarians. Because it's 1921. Before I speak a bit about McPhail's life and her political legacy, I'd like to suggest a few things to think about, which might help us to consider why it is important to learn about McPhail and women like her. And perhaps um, this will help to also stimulate a few questions in the chat later this evening. We might class McPhail among the great women of Canadian women's history. And so one of the things that we should consider in our discussion of Agnes McPhail is what it means to view Canada's history from the perspective of great women, or women worthies, as they're sometimes called. Although McPhail is not a household name to everyone, she is among those women firsts, those women whose achievements mark milestones in our history. In McPhail's case, being the first woman elected to serve in the House of Commons is reason enough to privilege her story in the classroom, in scholarship, and in public history. But I think there is also a need to be cautious 
in a so-called great woman approach to history. Of course, when we tell story, or history, when we tell stories in history from the perspectives of great women or great men, these are often the powerful, the winners or the victors. And they can sometimes overshadow lesser known figures, those people who are less privileged in a particular time or place due to their race or ethnicity or region or social class or sexuality or ability. And this is one of those things that I try to be aware of when I'm teaching history. And I think it's an especially important discussion to have uh, among students. Of course, there are many advantages to studying figures like MacPhail. We should recognize those women worthies, women who are pioneers in politics and in other aspects of public life. They tell us quite a lot about women's place, about attitudes toward women in the past, and, of course, the ways in which women worked to reform society. And those accomplishments would be remembered and honored. One of the advantages that historians who study such women often enjoy is an abundance of wonderful sources. This is especially true of MacPhail. Not only, as I mentioned, are there a number of excellent biographies written about her, but MacPhail herself left behind much correspondence, including personal letters and postcards, and also the letters which she wrote quite regularly to her constituents and also to school children. Hansard transcripts preserve her speeches in the House of Commons, and over her decades in politics, she granted many, many interviews to newspapers and magazines. MacPhail also composed a family history, My Ain Folk, the cover of which we see here on the left. Uh, and we also have here a one-page letter to her constituents, or a one-page, I should say, of a letter to her constituents from 1927. So there is a lot of material to draw on when we research women like McPhail. Another consideration that we might keep in mind when talking about Agnes McPhail and the history of other great women is how we situate women in the conventional wave model of women's history. When we date North America's first wave women's movement, as ending around 1920 with the fulfillment of the central goal of the suffrage movement, we can sometimes obscure or de-emphasize the contributions of groundbreaking women whose accomplishments don't fall neatly within that defined wave. And one other way, I guess, in which women like MacPhail help to shift focus in women's history is that they represent and advocate for rural women. And sometimes Canadian historians privilege the stories of urban women. And of course, it's so important in Canada's history to preserve the stories of rural life. So uh, MacPhail, uh, in her family life and her political interests, when we take those together, really helps to draw attention to rural history. So on to talking about Agnes MacPhail. As I suspect many of you are aware, and as noted in the promotional materials for this webinar, Agnes MacPhail was the first woman elected to the Canadian House of Commons. Here we have a photo of the parliamentarians elected in the fall of 1921. MacPhail, the only woman, is on the far right about three rows from the bottom among the progressive members of Parliament. I'd like to take some time now to speak about MacPhail's early life and influences, and then to say just a little bit about a few of the political causes she championed in the early years of her political career. In the interest of time, 
I'm going to focus on the first decade or so of MacPhail's public service, although there's an abundance of very interesting material from her later career as well. MacPhail was born in 1890 in Gray County, Ontario. Her, parent, her parents, Dougald MacPhail and Henrietta Campbell, were farmers of Scottish Presbyterian descent, and Agnes grew up contributing to the work of the farm, first in Proton Township and later at a new property near Flesherton, Ontario in Artemisia Township. Although she and her two sisters helped their mother with household chores, Agnes also helped her father with the animals and other labor on the farm. As a result, she was well aware not only of the hard work of farming, but also of the social inequities between men and women in rural life. As a grown woman in the early 1920s, she addressed the United Farmers of Ontario, and she drew on her experience of farm life to argue that while some believed that, and I quote, in farming, women break 50-50 with the men, but if this is true, it is $50 to the men and 50 cents to the women. Agnes came from a long line of strong, hard-working women, and she was very close to her grandmothers and her Aunt Maggie, seen here in this photograph. And it's not a stretch to say that she got at least some of her resolve from them. Although her parents decided that Agnes's formal education would end at the completion of her studies at the local primary school, Agnes was determined to attend high school. And this was an undertaking that would re require tuition payments and room and board in town. On a tight budget, it seemed impractical, if not impossible, to justify a daughter's higher education. But Agnes convinced her mother and grandmother to let her go, and she easily passed her high school entrance exams, and she attended Owen Sound Collegiate, and then later completed her teacher education at the Normal School in Stratford, Ontario, in 1910. For the next decade, MacPhail taught in schools in Ontario, and Alberta, and it was during those years that she became very involved in the United Farm Workers organizations. By 1919, her skill as a public speaker led to her election as director of the North York United Farm Women, and she sat on the executive of the women's section of the Canadian Council of Agriculture. In 1921, she was nominated by the United Farm Organization as an independent labor candidate for Southeast Gray County, and she won that nomination over 10 male candidates. On December 6, 1921, MacPhail became the first woman elected to Canadian Parliament, a liberal parliament, but with a record number of progressive seats. MacPhail's reception in Ottawa was mixed. Of course, many were skeptical about the abilities of a woman member. Politics at the time was thought to be uh, too dirty an environment for women, too corrupt for women. So the sudden appearance of a woman uh, in Parliament raised a few eyebrows. Not surprisingly, much attention was paid to MacPhail's physical appearance. She had worn a plain blue serge dress throughout her campaign, and once in Ottawa, the press criticized her. Sometimes they criticized her for dressing like a dowdy school teacher, and at other times they criticized her for indulging in the fashions of the day. And I think it's probably fair to note that this is often the fate of women politicians even today. We could look to Hillary Clinton as an obvious example of this. Although Prime Minister Mackenzie King 
and other members of Parliament gave speeches welcoming her to the House, their public welcome disguised some resentment. In an interview in 1929, MacPhail reflected, and I quote, When I was first elected, everything I said was wrong, everything I wore was wrong, everything I did was wrong, to hear comments about them. Bouquets were not thrown at me because I was the only woman in the house. Brickbats were what I got. The men did not want me in Parliament, and the women hadn't put me there. You can imagine how they felt when one morning they woke and found a girl from the country had been elected. I had entered as an independent and everybody was critical. The papers were full of it. MacPhail spoke out on a number of issues in her first term in Parliament, and many of her positions went against the conventional political grain. She spoke out against funding for cadet training in schools, supporting the view held by those in the peace movement and by many rural Canadians that military spending was misplaced. MacPhail felt that money was better spent on improving schools, especially rural schools, which she knew from her years of teaching were in great need of resources. She told her fellow MPs, quote, if the getting ready to kill somebody in some other country on account of some misunderstanding that may occur between rulers be patriotism, then I am no patriot. If living each day cleanly and striving to help our community, our province, and our dominion, to help youth see a vision of service to humanity, if that is patriotism, then I want to be a patriot. Citizenship today must be broader than nationalism. There must be an international consciousness, there must be an international heart and a world mind, an attitude or habit of thinking in the larger units of the world, and the habit of regarding the nations as cooperating parts of the great whole. Pause for a second to um, show you this photo of MacPhail in 1922. Remember, MacPhail was born in 1890. So when she was in 21, she was just 31 years old. Um, so when we hear her voice, um, She's a, a new parliamentarian. She's a relatively young parliamentarian, a young woman. And her idealism and altruism, I think, really sat, um, ring, ring true um, in these early quotes. Given MacPhail's very strong belief in peace efforts and in international cooperation, it's no surprise that in 1929 she would be invited to go to Geneva as a delegate, a delegate sorry, to the League of Nations. As the first woman delegate, she was assigned to what seemed a suitable committee, the Health and Welfare Committee. But she protested this and was instead assigned to the Disarmament Committee. Other issues for which MacPhail lobbied in her first term included capital punishment, which she opposed, the economic plight of miners and farmers, and an issue for which she would become renowned, the reform of penitentiaries. MacPhail had heard of the deplorable conditions of Canadian jails and went to tour the Kingston Penitentiary, but was told that no ladies were permitted. She replied, I'm no lady, I'm an MP. Appalled by what she saw, she eventually rallied support for a royal commission, which would bring about a number of changes in Canada's prisons, including a reduction in corporal punishment, improvement in dietary and medical standards, and mandatory education and exercise for prisoners. Now, in the interest of time, I've introduced and smoked, spoken just briefly about a few of MacPhail's efforts in her early years in politics. MacPhail would go on in her political career to um, serve in Parliament as an independent progressive with the United Farmers of Ontario until 1940. 
McPhail was a member of the Ginger Group uh, throughout the um, late 20s and into the 30s. This was a group of independents, many of them from farm organizations, who with J.S. Woodsworth would form the CCF, the Canadian Commonwealth Federation, in 1932. From 1943 to 1945, and then again from 48 to 51, McPhail would serve in the Ontario legislature as a CCF member. What you're looking at on your screen right now is um, perhaps the best known portrait, a uh, formal portrait, of McPhail by uh, Yusuf Karsh. Um, you can see the original, um, or an, an original uh, print um, at the Grey Roots Museum in Owen Sound. Throughout her political career, of course, MacPhail championed equality rights for women. She advocated for pay equity and for changes to divorce and citizenship laws, which disadvantaged women. At times, she was rather cheeky in defense of her feminist position. At a speaking engagement in 1926, she was heckled by a man who shouted, don't you wish you were a man? And MacPhail didn't miss a beat. She shouted back, yes, don't you? But more often than not, MacPhail was measured and firm in her rhetoric. In a public speech in Toronto in 1927, she said, I am a feminist, and I want for women the thing men are not willing to give them, absolute equality. She once told her fellow MPs, quote, when I hear men talking about women being the angel of the home, I always, mentally at least, shrug my shoulders in doubt. I do not want to be the angel of any home. I want for myself what I want for other women, absolute equality. After that is secured, then men and women can take turns at being angels. And she also spoke of the need for greater representation of women in the House of Commons. Half the people of Canada are women, and there seems no good reason why the voice of women should not be expressed in this House and through the actions of government, MacPhail said. We're getting toward the end of the formal part of my presentation, and I included uh, this later photo of MacPhail, uh, an informal snapshot uh, taken on a tour of Britain that she took in 1952. Um, MacPhail had done a lot of genealogical research. She was very, very um, uh, committed to her Scottish roots, and it was a great thrill for her to tour Britain uh, and to uh, see the land from which her uh, grandparents and great-grandparents came. MacPhail died in 1954, in her 64th year. Her obituaries filled newspaper columns across the country. Um, this particular image is uh, a posthumous tribute um, published uh, in the Kingston Penitentiary's KP Telescope. This is its cover, and it was one of many such remembrances. Um, because she was such a champion of the marginalized, of prisoners, of laborers, of women, um, many of those folks um, felt very strongly about honoring her contributions to Canadian public life. I can't help but think that MacPhail would be very pleased to know that women have achieved parity in today's cabinet. But true to her politics, I think she would see that with only 26% of seats in the House of Commons held by women in 2015, the need to advocate for women's equitable representation continues. I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning just a little bit about MacPhail's politics. Um, I certainly enjoyed uh, the little bit of 
research that I was able to share with you this evening. Um, I'm going to try, I'm not sure if I can figure out how to do this, but I'm going to try to um, backtrack a little bit to some of those larger questions that I think are important to consider when we talk about these great women in history. And I wonder if people have any questions related to these ideas or any questions about McPhail generally. As I said, I um, wanted to keep my presentation brief to leave time for any discussion. And um, I've done a lot, of, a lot of reading about McPhail, so if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer those too. see a few people typing on the screen. Take your time. Okay, Evelyn asks, do you think she would have rose so quickly within the United Farm Workers if it had not been during the war years when men were overseas fighting? Yes, Evelyn makes a very good point. Of course, when we look at uh, the suffrage movement, when we look at the accomplishments of um, suffrage during those years, um, we can't deny that women's contributions uh, during the First World War contributed to their very strong argument for enfranchisement. Um, I think that um, their participation in groups like the United Farm Workers um, certainly increased during that time, and um, it was um, to, to women's advantage to um, participate as fully as possible during those years. Yes, I, I have a feeling that the timing of her participation certainly had a lot to do um, with her um, ability to, um, to uh, gain um, notoriety and um, notice. Um, at the same time, when uh, we read about MacPhail and her biographers uh, repeat this again and again, she was a very, very uh, gifted speaker. She was very, very knowledgeable when it came to issues affecting um, farmers and, and farm life. Um, and I think that um, we have to give credit uh, to MacPhail herself for her successes. And Jessica asks, uh, can you speak to some of the challenges of researching a figure that has an ab has abundant sources? Yes, um, you know, having abundant sources, I suppose, is a blessing and a curse to historians, as I'm, I'm sure some of you here tonight uh, will acknowledge. Sometimes it's difficult to sift through all of those sources. The interesting thing about MacPhail is that you have everything from Hansard transcripts so her speeches in the House of Commons, to uh, a lot of writing um, by people who knew her personally. Um, the Grey Roots Museum has uh, a scrapbooks assembled by um, relatives. Um, there's quite an extensive uh, biography written by a man who I believe is her niece's husband, um, Doris Pennington, who uh, wrote uh, the book Agnes MacPhail, Reformer, uh, was also uh, a, friend, a family friend of the MacPhails. Um, so yeah, I think um, sifting through the sources and the various perspectives that these many, many sources offer is a real challenge to historians. Um, Evelyn asks, was MacPhail one of the per first public persons to use the word feminist? Um, she certainly, I think, was one of, or the first um, officially elected politician in Canada to use the word feminist. Um, I think when we look at Canadian history, the word 
feminist is used by some uh, reformers, by some women reformers. Um, it tends, however, in my experience, to be a word applied to those women as opposed to a word used very commonly by those women. So we tend to look back at these women in the past and um, refer to them as equal rights feminists or maternal feminists. Um, but it wasn't a word used as commonly by um, women in public life um, as it would be later, say, in that second wave women's movement. I wonder if there's anyone um, listening in this evening who has done any research on um, women like MacPhail, those great women in Canada's history who um, are often uh, the subjects of biographies. Um, and I wonder if anyone sort of has experiences in doing that kind of research that they'd like to share. I'm not sure that I see anyone typing at this point. Um, if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to take those. Otherwise, um, I don't know if I should turn things back over to Jessica at this point. I'll pop in with a question. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can comment on if in 1921, Agnes McBale said, it's, it's time for women to be in Parliament because it's 1921, and then in 2015, Justin Trudeau says a very similar thing. Um, why is gender equality so important? And he says because it's 2015. What, what has happened in between 1921 and 2015 that both supports and, and challenges this idea of women coming into the parliamentary roles? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and it's a very complicated question. Um, when we look across um, Western countries, developed countries, um, we see some countries who have achieved gender parity in uh, their representation in government. Um, and others who, who struggle to achieve that. And Canada, at 26% of women uh, parliamentarians, um, is, is kind of on the, on the low end. Um, and you wonder, I guess, and I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a political historian, but I do wonder what the structural inequities are that uh, prevent more women from entering politics? Um, is it the uh, pressures uh, still to uh, dedicate uh, balance to family life and uh, political life in a way that perhaps men don't experience that? I'm not really sure that there is an answer to that question, um, but it's certainly an important question to ask. Mm, Evelyn asks a great question. She says, how do you feel about gender parity as opposed to, say, merit? Should we not be appointing women based on merit and not gender? Of course we should. And I think when we look at um, the current cabinet, and this is, again, just my opinion, um, these are very uh, qualified women. Um, but when we ask the question of merit, um, it's not a question that we typically ask of um, men when they're appointed to cabinet. We also don't um, ask questions about um, merit if we attempt to uh, include regional representation. Um, so 
I, I guess, of course, merit is very important, and that is, you know, always a consideration. Um, but we have, you know, so many um, very highly qualified women and men that uh, the selection of a cabinet that represents uh, the population of Canada, I think, isn't uh, a misplaced uh, decision. Evelyn typing here, and I'm really looking forward to her follow-up on the question. Brent, oh, sorry. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I think obviously merit is is very very important. Um, I, I'm not sure that we need to be terribly concerned that the we are appointing women on the basis of merit who are not deserving. In that, um, very few people appointed to cabinet for the first time have any kind of experience with those portfolios um, as cabinet. Ministers, they have related experience, um, but often, you know, the first time that you're elected to parliament or the first time you serve in cabinet, um, a lot of things are new to you. So I think there's that argument as well. Um, I, I do think that, uh, again, merit is very important, and I also think that uh, the women who uh, have been appointed appear to um, merit those appointments. And again, that's just my opinion, and I'm, I'm not really a political scientist, but I appreciate you asking the question, and I think reflecting on MacPhail um, and her um, struggles early on in her political career to engage with issues and offer a little-known uh, perspective, a seldom-heard perspective, um, is, is kind of one way to get us thinking about these important issues today. While Evelyn's typing, I wanted to ask, in addition to Agnes McPhail, what other uh, women in Canadian Parliament would you recommend Canadians, us today, look into that also um, s s speak to the great things women can accomplish? Oh, wow. Off the top of my head, that's a really, really difficult question. Um, I should have been prepared for it, I suppose. I'm just kind of um, trying to put uh, off, off the cuff um, to kind of, uh, I, you know, Jessica, you're kind of stumping me here. Oh, sorry. Um, Evelyn, I'm not ignoring your question. Um, McPhail definitely made her views and opinions known. Do you think she was happy with what she achieved? Um, I like to think so. Um, when, when you read biographies about her, um, she always seems to be, in my, in my reading of these, to be looking ahead to the next issue and the next, um, uh, the next sort of struggle. Um, and she died very young, so I don't get from her, um, from reading, the, you know, the little bit of autobiographical writing uh, on, about her career, I don't get that that kind of resolution. I, I don't uh, I don't see that she was, as we might say, satisfied with her accomplishments. But I don't think she was displeased either. Um, and I wonder if um, she took the time that we might you know, have liked her to, to think about that. Oh, Flora McDonald, of course. Kathleen, that's an excellent suggestion.
we can see some typing going on. We will take a few more questions uh, and, uh, and then we might close it up for tonight. Yeah, Evelyn says, I've been researching lesser known women who've tried to achieve change through political means, and it's very hard to find good sources on them. Yeah, um, I guess when I was um, looking for sources on MacPhail, of course, I knew that um, the National Archives have files on MacPhail, um, but I also thought that it might be worthwhile to visit uh, a smaller more local archive because McPhail was from Gray County um, and I knew that the Gray Roots Museum and Archives had some sources. Um, I was excited to see what kinds of sources they might have. So I wonder about looking um, in local archives as opposed to kind of larger national or provincial archives. But I don't know what to suggest to you in that regard. Sometimes it, it is really difficult to find good sources on lesser known Canadian women. And it's quite a quite a coup when you do find um, great sources on, on little known figures. Oh, Minnie Bell Sharp and Emma Fisk, New Brunswickers. Interesting. Ah, question from Denise. Do you see anyone in today's political scene who you would compare to McPhail? Oh my, I'm not sure that I do. She is, um, she is a really unique figure. And I guess, you know, in part, it's because she speaks uh, a language of, of almost 100 years ago. Um, but when I hear her voice um, in the transcript, I, I just see her standing out as a really unique figure, and I'm having a hard time thinking of someone who I would consider comparable in more recent history. I guess, um, oh, oh no, sorry, I was going to suggest we conclude. I see one, one more question popping up here. That would be hard with 100 years between her and today, especially with all women have achieved. Yes, I think that's true. That's a good, good answer, Evelyn. Great. With that, I would like to say thank you, Renee, for joining us tonight for this webinar. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, just uh, lastly on the screen, and, and you can access this later because I know it will be archived, I, I put together a very short selected um, bibliography, and um, it includes uh, the the just a few of the biographies I mentioned, as well as a few really good digital sources. Um, and thank you. Thank you for participating, and thank you, Jessica, for having me.